denial, and here's a you know, and here's a set of facts and criteria you want to approve. But, uh, yeah. Table because I don't know where else. Let me just hand yes. these out. I'll but keep one for myself has, so I can see. She gets the bus if, and if the train is on time. If the train is I on said time. just pop it on it. Melissa, am I going to be able to share the screen? Yes. Yeah, I usually can. Yeah, now that I think about it. So. <laughs> yeah, it would be different to that. Hey, Alex, who's away from town, it looks like she's sitting in the sun. Can you hear us here? Not. You're the best. Thank you. I can hear you. Hi. Here you are. Yeah. It's cold here. I'm, I'm in Miami. <laughs> no, so no. We can see that. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. We love it. But I'm here to talk about community character. Yay! She's she's loyal to the soil of Woodstock. Yes. I'm gonna say, gonna say there's two people on screen. Which one's the community character? <laughs> All of us. <laughs> Both of them. That's the right answer. <laughs> Whoever's playing hacky sack. <laughs> I have to choose what happens. I need yeah, to find our. Can go ahead and start. Uh, okay. I need to find our <laughs> Zoom link. Okay, it is six o'clock, and uh, I would like to call to order the uh, workshop hybrid meeting of the Woodstock Planning Board from March thirtieth, two thousand twenty-three. Are there any updates to the agenda? There are not. We have the minutes from March 16th. If we would everybody agree to accept them as is? Um, so, uh, I, so, yeah, I. Okay. So, under scheduled business, for this workshop meeting, we decided on the topic of community character. With the growing development within our town and ever changing community standards, this should give us some more tools we need to evaluate upcoming and current applications. We had touched on community character some time ago with John Lyons, and we can further look into it with the CEQR and EAF workshops, workbooks, for more information after this. I would like to thank Mr. Dennis Doyle, Director of the Ulster County Planning Department, for always being available to us and being willing to come and teach us those valuable resources that we use for every application we see. So now I will turn it over to Dennis. Thank you. Um... If nobody minds, I'm going to stand. I, I know this sounds like a lecture, no but it, it, it's, it helps my back. I'm getting to the age where my back bothers me. Actually, I'm getting to the age where just about everything bothers me. Uh, but um, did you manage to find that? That's okay. uh, yeah. So um, I I didn't want to do a presentation, but I sort of when I looked and saw that there was a number of people that were going to be here on Zoom, I thought it would be better if I had a few slides and slides, and there are only a few. So I would like to do this on the basis of a conversation rather than a presentation. It's a lot, lot better for me, and, and I really appreciate you giving me an easy topic like community character. Uh, and uh, and and if I say anything that sounds like it's legal, it's not. I am not an attorney. Uh, and I'll repeat that if you if you have anybody ask me in terms of an opinion. Um, so uh, a couple of things from my perspective looking at this is, is when we look at community character, there's an old saying is, is that I know it when I see it. Um, and it's like modern art, I guess, to a certain extent. But um, when you look at the, at the handbook and you look at the case law, um, what you're going to find is, is that there's, there's really not a lot of guidance out there. And in some instances, the guidance that DEC gives you seems to be contra contradictory. Um, but there's, if there's anything that I would tell you relative to community character is that the reviewing agency needs to understand what the existing community character is. If you can't articulate or you don't have specific uh, goals in mind, or you don't have 
specific language within your zoning statute, uh, and I'll be talking something about design guidelines as well, it becomes very much subjective when you start to say this is a problem. And remember that the secret question with respect is to, to uh, community character basically starts with the negative. Um, so it becomes really, really difficult um, to make decisions in terms of what constitutes a significant impact with respect to community character if you don't really understand what your existing community character is. So my question to you and to the group is, is there within your comprehensive plan? Is there within your policies of the board? Is there within your zoning statute something that will give you Can't hear anymore. Well, a comp plan refers to it as an artist community and, and, and uh, encouraging arts and art uh, activities. So I guess part of our character is art. Anyone else? Okay. So um, the Department of Environmental Conservation defines it essentially as natural and man made features that constitutes community character. So looking at your, your, your response with respect, it's about art. My question is, is there any natural and man-made features that you would say this constitutes our community character? This is, these are things that, that we're really, really concerned about. Well, then the comprehensive plan really indicates that it's the natural environment and the scenic uh, vistas of our town that makes our environment. Okay. And the small town. Character. Yeah, small town character. Can I just ask what is the community? Historical building. Well, there certainly can be geographic characters associated with that. Main Street is different, for example, than Cooper Lake. Um, and those are things that you can take into account when you start looking at. So it's not a unified community character, but it is something that would be um, consistent with the land use around it. And, and, that brings me to the second bullet here, and that's the type and intensity of land use. So a lot of a lot of times when you're having a discussion about community character, you end up having a discussion about the type and intensity of land use. So the example I would give you is multifamily versus single family. The example, other example I would give you is lot coverage, thinking about lot coverage work with relative to that on subdivisions or on even commercial buildings. How much green space is there? Is there anything in your zoning statute that talks about green space, talks about lot, lot coverage? What about people? So what I would tell you is, is that, the, the, in my opinion, the guidance from DEC seems to be contradictory in that it starts out by defining community character as natural man-made features. And then it goes on, if you read through it, it begins to start a discussion about things like uh, community services, impact on community services, where you're um, basically changing the way or the number and times of, of where community, of the community services that are needed to police, fire, and ambulance. For me, and that's me, that does not, that's not a community character issue, but the guidance within DEC says that it is. Oh. Um, so I'll, I'll just, I'll leave you with that. If the case law doesn't, there's, there, there, there's so the paucity of case law that I've been able to find doesn't suggest that that's that is the case. That the the case law seems to suggest that community character is rooted more in aesthetics uh, and intensity than it is in terms of uh, impact on on services. Well, I'm asking a slightly different question. It isn't so much a question of services as what kinds of people are enabled to be in a place. Wow. Um, the, or tend to be in a place. So um, the I think you I'm going to step outside the secret process for a certain extent, and I think if you're suggesting that there is a, a means to essentially control either the rates uh, or or the uh, or the affordability of things, that you're going to run into some issues that are outside of the secret document, uh, particularly with respect with respect to. Um, the, the issues with respect to social justice and, and equity and diversity. And then the second piece of that is with respect to affordability as it comes to the fair housing question. Um, and 
There are things, the example I would give you is there are preemptions and zoning statutes that occur. Those preemptions, I'll, I'll give you one preemption that's out there is mental health group homes. The state has preempted local zoning for mental health group homes. There's also preemptions for, um, for other types of things relative to, uh, relative to zoning. And one of those would be um, daycare facilities. Um, so you run into, you run in, you have to step outside sometimes to see your document and begin to start to think of what other zoning, what other uh, statutes or, uh, or laws are in place that you, that you can't run afoul of. Um, and the fair housing statute is one of the ones that I would be really concerned about if we were basically having a discussion, well, we don't want affordable housing because there are different kinds of people that would, would be associated with it. Or we don't want, um, um, the example, the other example I would give you, mental health group homes because of that. And there have been preemptions with respect to that. Does that answer your question? Well, it does, but it doesn't. I mean, one of the things that I think, one of the ways I have been wording the problem is we're turning into a theme park. How do you preserve the, a diversity of people who live here as opposed to commercial uses of things that didn't used to be commercial? Mm -hmm. a, a town that really uses the library or a town where there is volunteerism or a town where people who don't have money can get a, th a big Thanksgiving dinner, you know, all those sort of things. And a home. At a home. Or a town where people with kids can afford to live, and so the school stays open because otherwise it might close. So I would be hesitant to do it under a community character discussion, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other tools that you could use relative to things that you can do to Ensure, help ensure diversity, particularly with respect to income levels and other things that you can do with respect to uh, gentrification, which is commonly, yes. commonly talked about. Uh, and then last but not least, in, in, at least in Woodstock that I'm aware of, is the impact of other types of uses using things for, for different purposes. And the example I would give you here is short-term rentals. That's exactly yeah. where my question is from. And, and clearly, there's a whole host of regulatory uh, discussions with respect to short-term rentals. I won't get into them. It's just that you need to proceed with care if you're going to try to differentiate between short-term rentals as it relates to owner occupancy and short-term rentals as it relates to non-owner occupancy. There's some really good case law that suggests that you should stay away from that. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and um, there's a the case is actually involves the, the violation of the interstate commerce clause. Um, which basically says people should have an equal chance to participate. And if you, you uh, move out and you say you have to be live in the community or live in the house, and in order to have a short-term rental, then, then you you're, you have that, that sort of violation. And I believe that is a case out of Western, in the Western state. I don't quote me on the case. I don't remember it. I've read it, but I don't remember it. But there are ways around it. I mean, there are clearly ways around that. You know, city of Kingston is in the process of developing a new uh, zoning code and they found a, a fairly creative way uh, to deal with that. And there's, you know, there's there's also a blunt way to deal with it and just say, we're not, we're, we're not gonna do short term rentals at all, whether you own them or don't. Um, there's a, there's some of that, some of that, there's some, there are a number of ways that you can do that. Um, I'll leave it at that. Anything else? No, that's exactly what I wanted to. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, in, um, so the, the third bullet here is community character is in part influenced, and I, I want to emphasize in part uh, influenced by the buildings and structures that exist in the community. And then uh, you mentioned the the, uh, the uh, natural environment as well. So um, has anybody ever seen a community appreciation survey or a community survey that essentially looks at the various things within the community and starts to rank them? So that, those are those things are usually done as part of a comprehensive plan. There's a number of pictures, and they basically start to say, well, what, how do you rank this picture? That's called a community preference survey. Um, how, how do you rank those things? Those are the types of things that you can start to look at and, and utilize to try to help you. Remember that first bullet is trying to define what, it's, what you should know as a reviewing agency, what your community character is. You should try to understand it. So that the, one of the things you can use is those community preference surveys, and and to do those things right, you need you know you 
you need you need some you know you, you should incorporate them somewhere when they're finished somewhere in, in terms of um, where they fit in your zoning statute or where they fit in your uh, comprehensive plan. Any, anybody questions on community preference surveys? Uh, I can tell you a very interesting story. We did a we did a uh, 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 training seminar for planning board members that looked at uh, community preferences, and it was in relationship to density uh, because there's always this question with respect to. I mean, in in uh, I have a, a name for it. Uh, it's called it's too big itis. No matter what is proposed, it's too big to start with. Um, and so um, we took a look and. Work with a consultant and they came through and they said we were we did it online. It was really neat because the, the people that were online could actually vote their preferences online. Um, and almost to every slide that we used that looked at density, um, the slide that was preferred, the picture that was preferred, was a greater density than the one that wasn't preferred. Mm -hmm. uh, the example I would give you, which I was really surprised at. Um, was the difference between the preference in terms of large, 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 large lot um, development in fields versus essentially community development in in high in, de in denser subdivisions? Um, and then when we start, we started to look at, at and do pictures that basically said guess the density. Here's here's the development guess the density, um, and in general, the density that was was. It was the closest in terms of the ones that were guessed the most was a lot less dense than, than the development actually was. And so what you can start to see is, is that good design um, and attention to detail uh, is really important in terms of setting the feel and tone and character of some of the developments that, you, that, that, that uh, occur. And, the other thing I would say is most zoning statutes, if they don't have design guidelines in them, most zoning statutes and most planning boards are very reluctant to begin a design discussion. Um, whether it be the architectural elements associated with the building, whether it be placement of placement on the building and the lot, whether it be where, where parking lots go, landscaping, the type of landscaping it used, where it is. Um, they tend to sort of stick to the basics, which is we're supposed to, you know, hide it from the neighbor, set it back so much from the street. Um, and then sort of once we get past that, the rest is left to the developer, uh, whether it be a slope roof or whether it be uh, uh, what color, what color the building is, what uh, fenestrations are on the building, whether there's, um, whether there's any stone on the building or not stone on the building. All of those things are design discussions that a lot of planning boards don't want to involve themselves in. Um, some boards, some some communities have community design community design boards. I think Woodstock does. We do. You know, so they sort of default to that board. Um, but I, but the the point being is is that you really need to think about those things if you're going to have a discussion about community character because it's one of the ways that you can mitigate community character. And it's one of the things that you can talk about when, when it comes to things that you're looking for. There's a, there's a, a good DOS a department, New York State Department of State course that basically says how to get the community you want. Uh, and it talks about things that you can put in your zoning statute, things that you can do in terms of review process to make sure that that's the case. Um, one of the most recent things that have coming, not, not that recent, but one of the things that are coming up, I think a lot of boards are, are working and struggling with is resiliency, sustainability, as it relates to climate change. Um, and I would, I would probably guess that there's not a lot of, not a lot of language in your code that deals with those things. But yet you're, that's a comfort level that boards have. But when we start talking about architectural review or, or we need to do this or how the buildings sit on the site, south facing buildings, for example, that becomes a lot less, a lot less comfort level with that. But it's something that you can do and you, and you should think about and you should begin, begin to start to see how you put it in trouble. Any questions? I'm not hearing any, but I'm going to start asking questions. If, May I have a question? Sure. Okay. Um, I do want to get back to community character for one minute. If you have, and just give an example, if you have a primarily 
residential area, even if it was historically uh, mixed zone, commercial and residential, but it's been residential for many, 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 many years. So does moving in a commercial property become a question of community character? So there's no one answer for that. I'll give you, and, and I'm not being evasive. What I would say to you is that there is within case law uh, and within generally accepted standards of how zoning statutes work, right? Mm -hmm. If the zoning statute allows the use, right, then the question becomes a lot less clear in terms of whether there's a significant impact on community character. Are there other elements other than community character, though, that can be and should be considered, like impact on the community itself, or things like um, priorities for the town, like affordable housing becomes a priority if something is contrary to that? So, um, I, don't know if clear, but I, I hear what you're saying. The, the short answer is, is that um, you have to look at the statutory the statutory charge in terms of in terms of doing that. The example I give you with respect to affordable housing is the town has an inclusionary zoning statute that basically says a portion of any new subdivision or any new multifamily unit has to be affordable. Then you have the regulatory structure in terms to say that that's what we're going to do here. You have a minimum affordability requirement. We are urging towns to adopt minimum affordability uh, requirements somewhere in the 10% range and then looking at when, when it kicks in somewhere in the 10 units or more range. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's up to the community. Uh, but we, we are urging that. We think that, that we have a program out at the county level now called the Housing Smart Communities Initiative. I know Woodstock has joined. I know Deborah Devon has been um, engaged with us from the beginning when we did a housing action plan. She's um, on this call, by the way. Oh, well, that, then I, Deborah's been doing a, a fantastic and wonderful job. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> hey there, guys. I'll shut up. <laughs> in, in, in all seriousness, I mean, she's an amazing resource and the community is very, very lucky to have. I guess I'm just trying to find out what can be considered in regards to the um, not only the physical nature of a section of community, but with regard to the people who are living there and the impact of something new and different in the area. Well, I, new and different is, is, is well, not commercial a, versus. Well, the example I would give you is there's a case um, out there, and it's, it actually is a case, I think, in Ulster County. It was WEOK, which was a radio tower in a town of Lloyd. Um, and the court determined that absent, um, it was a visual impact study. Uh, but absent, the only thing that the town had to essentially go against what was uh, a very rigorous analysis of visual impact by the applicant was some unsubstantiated uh, sentiments from what that visual impact would be by residents and by the board itself. And this was an appellate court case. Again, I'm not an attorney. Uh, this is an appellate court case where they said, thank you very much, but no thank you. The applicants, the applicants basically exhaustive analysis of what constitutes the, the visual impact prevailed. And the town's denial was overturned. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to basically talk about impacts, then you have to back it up. Um, the, the examples I would give you that we start to see is the challenge or the charge that somehow certain types of things reduce uh, property values. And you'll hear this, whether it be affordable housing, whether it be certain kinds of uses adjacent to other kinds of uses, and the applicant will come and say, here's a host of studies that basically say that doesn't occur. So you're, you need, if you're as a board, if you're going to say, well, we, we believe, you know, we believe it does, then you need something to essentially uh, deal with that issue that's, that's out there right now. And the one court case that cited this, they basically, what it said, and I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase, um, that if it's permitted within the zoning district, it's tantamount to a legislative finding that is, that is consistent with community character. So if your town board said, we're gonna allow this use, 
And in particular, uh, we're gonna allow this use by special permit. And the applicant can meet all of the requirements in a special permit, because usually there's a set of standards that go with a particular use for a special permit, maybe setbacks, maybe uh, other types of things associated with it. Then it's tantamount to essentially saying that if I meet those standards, I deserve that permit. Those standards were created in, uh, in the past and things have changed. Then it would be compounded upon the town to essentially amend the standards. So that's that's literally what we're dealing with. I mean, I I, I always try to think that that the seeker doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, and it doesn't grant any more authority to a board than, than an authority within the statute. Um, so when you start to think about how these things work, you really need to think about um, what the statute says. The other thing is, is that the statute can give you power. This goes back to your, your question with respect to what else can we do? The statute can give you power that's outside of affordability, that's outside of the secret document. Uh, and clearly, in, in some of these instances, for example, most Right now, you have a tweaker, don't you? Have your we tweaker? do. Oh my gosh, uh, it's been a while since I've read that. When's the last time you updated that? Early comp plan. I think, right? Yeah. 2018. So, the point being is, is that um, there are certain things you can do outside of Seeker that, that are, are um, uh, can, can work towards uh, things like I just mentioned with respect to affordability. Um, the other thing, there are certain things that you can do in the town. Newfalls has done this um, with respect to design. Uh, how Newfalls requires for all new structures in its highway business district to be two stories and to have a functional section, a second story. And there are some exemptions. Like for example, I think, I think gas stations and others are exempted. But drugstores, those kinds of things, offices, they have to have a functional section, second story. Which could be office yeah. space or housing? Mm -hmm. Office space or housing. They, they basically want it to be used for housing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what they say. Basically, one and then, and then, and I quoted the statute wrong. Don't I believe that the priority is housing. I don't know whether it's a requirement, but I believe the priority is housing. Uh, and they've gone through great, through great lengths in terms of reviewing various entities to, to essentially make sure that that's the case. They've also, quite frankly, New Falls, I know New Falls, I think, has a fairly poor reputation with respect to the, the review process, but they've done a really, really, really good job relative to some of the work that they've done on Main Street. Uh, they've rezoned the whole section of uh, Route 32 coming out of the village to higher densities. They just completed a project on there called Net Zero. It's a three-story project. Uh, to, I think it's an asset to the village as you come in. It's a great gateway to the village compared to what was there. Um, and those are things I think that you need to take into account. Um, the other thing I think people look to the idea of community character is that we're moving in and we're creating a clash between what's there now versus what's proposed. And always what's proposed is worse than what's there now. But I also wanna take the position that there are a number of commercial areas and communities that are just not well planned out and they reflect thinkings from the 70s, mm -hmm. right? Now I come in and I wanna build a building and it's modernized. And quite frankly, is not in keeping with the rest of the, the, the stuff that's there, it's, it's a lot better. Is that a significant impact on community character? Because it's different? Or is, or is it something that the community's new standard says that's what we want? So I want you to keep that in mind that just because it's different doesn't mean it's, 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 not, it's not appropriate. I think I'm only on the first page. You are, but we can certainly go along. Wow. Let's see if I can get it to go to another. Melissa, I think there are a few people who are on Zoom who may want to ask questions. Thanks. <laughs> I see Deb's hand up, so we'll let Deb well, see. There's a question. There's a question. I was just saying, the community, the community has an interest in taking care of the STEM over gentrification. If, if we want to use that word, or overdevelopment, let's put it that way. Yeah, what other than the community character can be used? And, and also what can be used to take into account the lifestyle of the people in the community, the neighbors who will be impacted, let's say by additional noise and lighting and traffic and increases in 
that so clearly when it comes to noise traffic and that kind of thing there are really good standards for that i mean we don't have to we don't have to reach in a community character to have those discussions uh, there are well accepted standards for that communities at some peril could change those standards but the department of environmental conservation department of transportation department of environmental conservation has a significant amount of standards with, res with respect to traffic noise and others and there's all, all kinds of guidelines in terms of how you do that work and how you measure that, those impacts. So I wouldn't reach into a community character discussion to talk about to talk about those impacts. But the question you asked me with respect to gentrification, I wouldn't reach into community character to talk about gent gentrification. I would reach into other, I would basically, the, the planning board is not only responsible for reviewing applications, it's also responsible, and as, as you probably know, because of the other work that we've done, also responsible for going back to the town board and saying, these are things we'd like to change. We, this is what we're noticing. And these are things we'd like to change. And this is how we, these are recommendations that we can make to change the, the comprehensive plan. These are, these are things that we can, we can, um, we can do to, to, to change the, uh, the zoning statute. I don't like the term gentrification. I kind of like the term diversity uh, or, or equity um, rather than gentrification, but I understand where you're coming from. It's a well-established term in, in, the, in the vernacular. But my point being is, is that I think if you're going to do that, you would go to the zone. Excuse me. The for the wicked, huh? Yeah, no. Uh, I see you, Alex. My problem Alex, is I oh. can't see hands. I know. So. Alex, uh, hi. Hi. Yeah, I just have a question, um, which is that coming from a different perspective when i hear community character i start to be concerned that it's something that is used as a weapon to prevent us from getting for example housing that maybe some parts of the community might find undesirable but that we need um and so how do you do you have a recommendation for a balance of using this as a tool to um, keep the values of a community, but also keep the values of what a community might look like, you know, going into the future and what we want it to look like without having those kinds of concerns, because it definitely can be used as a weapon of like, oh, we don't want, you know multifamily housing to look like multifamily housing or we don't want this or we don't want this when the reality is that we are a changing community um we're going to continue to be a changing community um and and particularly as more and more people are looking to safer places to be, you know, as the climate is changing, um, you talked about, you know, resilience, things like that. We're positioned in a in a pretty solid place for that in many ways. It's desirable to a lot of people. How do we allow for that without shutting them out by saying, oh, that's not that's that's not in the character of this community? Because it definitely sounds like a scary phrase in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, and I think you're right. Um, are you finished? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you're right. I think um, the concern about community character, and this, uh, this is in, this is my uh, discussion of this. The concern about community character is it's it's a bit amorphous, um, and it goes back to what I said. I know it when I see it. Kind of question. Um, and a way to deal with that is there are fairly simple ways to deal with it, and it goes to back to how you get the community you want. Um, and that includes changing the community you have. Um, and the example I would give you is there's two really good examples. One is design standards or design guidelines. Now design guidelines are exactly that, they're guidelines. Design standards are a little bit different. Design standards says thou shalt do this. Um, design guidelines says, well, the planning board may or may not or the, whatever implementing agency may or may not require that, but this is what we're looking for. Um, I think Woodstock has a, an overlay district. Uh, they have a- they have overlay? A, we have a scenic overlay. We have a number of overlays, but that one is- and, and, and there are certain things that you expect within that overlay district. 
you, there's colors, I would presume. There's there's what you can clear. Um, all there, and, and you've used some precedent to set those things, right? You basically said that, that these are the colors we like, these are things you can't do up here, these are like certain things that we, we were concerned about. One of those cases. Placing, <laughs> and you should. Um, but my point being is, is that going back to, to Alex, right? Yes. Going back to Alex's question, what you do is you start to carry that through into the other areas of the town rather than just the scenic overlay district. Right. And you begin to start to carry those same kinds of policies, those same kinds of concerns with respect to colors, relationship to the street, relationship to the neighbors, so how landscaping is presented, where parking lots go. You carry that those kinds of things down and you make sure that applicants are aware of them when when you when you uh, when they when they submit and the other thing that you do is if those if a if they're design guidelines my our recommendation has been in the past for the applicant it's not to have the planning board basically try to guess what the app how the applicant needs the design guidelines but rather to have the design guidelines in a fashion number one two, number three, number four, whatever they are. Um, here's parking, here's fenestrations, here's landscaping, here's glazing, here's the relationship to the road, here's how we access roads. And to have the applicant as part of an application write a report that says, we've looked at your design guidelines and this is how we feel that we meet them. Does this apply to private single-family houses? Or well, you need a permit. If they don't require a permit, then you can't require it. But if they so do they require, have to have a permit. Well, they don't require a planning board. Generally, single-family exactly. homes don't have don't require planning. That's board. my point. Well, That's so point. if if you're really concerned about that, then what you end up doing is you incorporate it so that the the, the building inspector, the zoning enforcement officer, essentially essentially can can look at those things just as a planning board. So rather than a discretionary decision or what I would call an iterative decision involving the board, it's 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 essentially pushed off on the zoning enforcement after that says he met these these design guidelines and that's why he got the permit. Right. So those are things you can do. And there's a lot of that going on nowadays where, where in order to streamline the, the review process, some of the routine discretionary decisions are put off. And they're placed in a and they're placed in a, in a in a individual's hand. They're not ministerial to to a certain extent, but they are they are placed in a zoning enforcement officer hand. And then the, the board has some oversight or, or or at least some some indication that things are going wrong that you, you have a problem. You have, I think, you used to have. I know what you still do. You had uh, site plan review was required for certain kinds of things, but for smaller types of things. The board can determine by itself that site plan, the attempt site plan review was met and then waive it as I Absolutely. recall. So though that's that'll give you an example of what you could do to take it the next step further, particularly with respect to uh, individual individual buildings or individual uh, uh, work from single family homes, taking that next step further. So the answer to Alice's question is one is one is one is design guidelines, and the next level of that is design standards. Um, we have recommended, in, particularly in certain kinds of areas, that we talk about design standards. And the example I would give you is historic districts. Um, and sometimes there are historic district boards that already have their design standards. And so that would go, they, they did that. Yeah. Deborah has a, has a question. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Deb. You're up. Hi. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit, Dennis. Okay. Um, uh, because uh, in talking about, um, as you know, I, I co-chair this housing oversight task force and we're working on some zoning updates to reflect um, uh, some of the goals, actually to reflect the goals in the 2018 comprehensive plan, which have not been updated in the zoning. So, um, and we have been looking at the two, the, the notion of community character and what is articulated in the comprehensive plan as a guide to help define direction. Um, and, and the comprehensive plan talks about environmental values and talks about the need to address housing options. So, and then obviously how that is done in code is sort of the separate thing, but the hope is that 
the uh, strengthening the connection uh, as I understand it, the zoning should be consistent with a comprehensive plan. So we're bringing those two into alignment is going to help with community character, um, sort of building that sense of what is a community character. Um, uh, Peter mentioned artists, talked about scenic. We've also talked about diversity uh, of uh, whether it's uh, architectural, but also in terms of of um, as Judith was saying, in terms of the population itself, in terms of diversity. So we're seeing in the language in the comprehensive plan opportunities to take those principles and then put them into code. I'm interested to know, um, because there, there was a survey done, there was a lot of work done in developing comprehensive plan. And I think, and it wasn't that many years ago, and maybe there's a way for us to um, bring that back into uh, the community and our awareness, since we're having a very robust conversation now about all these things. And it's really exciting to see how many different ways we can come at this, at this issue. And I'm wondering outside of Seeker, to what extent do you see the comprehensive plan helping to guide this process? as we go forward. Oh, it's, it's critical. There's no doubt in my mind it's critical. And to the extent that your comprehensive plan not only talks about community character, but actually illustrates community character, you're much better off. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that I'm most disappointed in with respect to where we are from a technology perspective versus where we are from a, uh, a code perspective is that we have an amazing amount of technology that can do graphically what we're trying to do with words. Uh, and I think that the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. You mean in the code? Yeah, I mean in the code. Uh, and if you want to, why don't we skip this slide and go to the next slide? <laughs> So I've been talking about form-based code since the first year I came on the planning board. And like, <laughs> if so one of the things, yeah, one of the things that form-based code does, besides give you a whole sense of what form you're talking about, it and, and people are generally accepting accept the fact that if I can see it and I can understand it and I know what's going, I can understand what's going to be, be able to build be built in certain places in the town. I'm much more comfortable in terms of what my zoning statute means. The, the thing that people are li less comfortable about form-based code is doesn't control use. Generally, if you meet the form, we're not concerned about the use. Um, generally, I said, but, but they, they do control use to a certain extent with respect to transit. Kingston is engaged, and I think Kingston zoning statute has, um, has existed since 1968. Um, and it has been um, packed at, um, clubbed on, anything that you can think that you should do wrong with a zoning statute and a zoning, <laughs> and a zoning map probably happened in Kingston between 1968 and 2023. Um, and that's not a problem with respect to the city. It just reflects the idea that the attention that the city was given to its land use forms uh, because there wasn't a lot of change um, and there wasn't a lot of building ac activity um, was different than the attention it was giving to things that it had to do like water, sewer, road systems, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, if you, I used to call it designer zoning. If you needed something, you went to the city and the city took a look and said, well, that works. That's, we think that works and, um, and amended the zoning statute. Um, so now they went through a, 2025 plan update, comprehensive plan update, and they've decided, I think, with an amazing amount of, uh, of support from, from the elected officials and from the planning board uh, and from others to go to a form-based code. Uh, and this form-based code, form-based codes generally, what they do is they basically divide, the, they usually do, they divide the community into what they call transects. Um, and so 
within the Broadway corridor, there are certain kinds of buildings and certain heights and certain things that they're saying, this is what we want to do. Um, and when you move out of the Broadway corridor, there may be what they call special district transects. So, for example, Golden Hill in our area and some of the other areas in the city are, are deemed to be they're different than the areas surrounding them. And so we've made them into a special district transect. We're going to, we're going to take another look at that. Um, but go to the next, go to the next, I think the next slide does this. Hopefully. Oh, so yeah, it does. So what they, when you go into the code and you look, they start defining buildings. They tell you that this is the kind of building that goes in this transect, and this is what it looks like. And here are the things that have, here's the characteristics of it. And then they give you a picture and they say, that's what we're talking about. So if you're, if you're reviewing the code or you're implementing the code or you're applying for the code, you know what's expected of you in any particular area within the city. But you, it doesn't, the use is doesn't come into. There are some use restrictions here, as I recall. But generally, form based code, what we're trying to do is you're trying to establish the form of the building and how it relates to the street and how it relates to its neighbors. And you wouldn't permit like a 20 story skyscraper or anything. Else. No, uh, but I, I will tell you what it does do. I mean, for example, we took a look at the Broadway corridor and suggested that they think their original form-based code had three or four stories in the Broadway corridor, whatever that number was. And we suggested, we looked at the Broadway corridor and we suggested most of these buildings are higher than that. Why don't you think about a different, a, a different, a different height limitation? So I think they've gone to four or five stories in the Broadway corridor in terms of looking at that transect. Well, my point being is, and this is to Deborah's point, and, and I think somebody else has a question, I apologize. Um, but my point being is a form-based code gives you the opportunity as a board to know this is what the community has telling us what we're enforcing, right? And it gives me as a member of the community to say, if I move here, I live in this transect, right? This transect allows this kind of buildings. So the questions with respect to community character sort of get, they sort of bubble down, right? Because it's not amorphous anymore. We've defined it. Getting to the community you want. The community character is really a function of design mm -hmm. in the environment to more, and then questions of whether the usage fits in or the impact on, let's say, the human population of the area are really separate issues from community character. That's, or the, that's or a question. Like, yeah, yeah, or like Judith said, the Disneyfication of a place. <laughs> it becomes nothing but. <laughs> rental, you know, short-term rentals and restaurants and gift shops. So I don't want to limit myself because the Department of Environmental Conservation doesn't limit itself to a discussion that says it's only about, it's only about the physical structures. I would also say it's also about the natural structures. We haven't, yeah, okay. we haven't discussed that, yeah. but they go on to say that there are other things that may be involved in, in the community character discussion, and that has to do with um, services, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or the example, I think they use one of the examples that they use is uh, affordable housing example. And I think they use an example of attracting a lot of people to areas where there's not a lot of people now. I'm not sure that those, those things are community character. And I'm not sure that it's not better off thinking about other ways that we deal with those things. But those with, are things the planning board can consider. Absolutely, yeah. That's well, just not well, character, perhaps. Yeah, depending upon the zoning statute right. they can consider, and depending upon what's in the, what's in their site plan review statute and their special permit statute. And, right. and let me just ask one other question. If, if, they're in the, if there's the process of updating those zoning laws, which we understand is happening now, should any major decisions be held in advance while that process is going through? Well, let me let me take that let me take that um, in terms of practicality versus um, idealism. I don't want to use that term, but I couldn't think of another one, so I apologize for it because I don't, I'm not an idealist. Um, but Why not? I knew I had upset somebody. I'm a practical idealist. It is sometimes advantageous to fight off the, 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 the piece that you can chew, right? Rather than essentially sit there and try to say to yourself, 
I think we should do the whole thing. And two years later, you haven't done anything. And from my perspective, um, the planning board can be a really good sounding board to say, these are the things that are giving us the most trouble. And these are the things that we'd like to have more guidance on. To the town board. Um, to the town board. Yeah. And then if you're working with, for example, a housing commission or an environmental commission or, or a, um, some other co community services commission, then you can say, we, we, we think that these things are appropriate for us to consider recognizing the fact that this is only a first step. We have other steps that we want to take. But I don't want to, I don't, I would want to freeze the process. And, and the example I would give you, and I think it's a Woodstock example. The Saratoga Associates did a comprehensive plan for this town many, many, many years ago, right? And it had all kinds of maps in it. It was, it was really one of the things when we reviewed it, it was one of those plans where you say somebody finally basically are going to base a comprehensive plan, not just on goals, but actually understanding the community that they're living in. Well, we, you could, you, you could have you could have literally couldn't have said anything worse because now now there was really now there was a, a, a sense of well we should build here versus there and we should say this versus that and that didn't match with what everybody thought was should be done in the community so they spent years i think peter fairweather and i think came back twice basically discussing the fact that they didn't want to adopt that comprehensive plan because it has it had a map based component that was at least enough that they could understand where, where things were going and what where how they would make decisions with respect to zoning. So we finally suggested, I think the last time we were here, we suggested that rather than adopt the entire comprehensive plan, which had all the maps in it, why don't you just adopt the executive summary that said this is what the maps will, will show you? And that, and I'm not sure whether that ever got adopted, or they basically said we think we're going to go back and redo the Goes back to my disappointment with respect to what's in zoning codes. The thing that's disappointing about what's in comprehensive plans are when we have goal, goals and objectives with no geographic location. Goals and objectives with no geographic location literally basically go, well, we're going to leave it to somebody else to make the decision. Let me go back a moment to the question of services. Sure. When we think about affordable housing, one of the things we have to think about is that in a community that is aging and where a lot of homes are owned by people who are not here full time, and many of them are older people, to the extent that we can't house younger people, we won't have a fire department or an EMT because those are volunteer or they're very low paid and it all depends on people who are young enough to take a big role in volunteerism. And that's mostly people who can't afford to live here. So it is partly a question of who the people are in the community, but that's tightly connected to the question of services. Diversity, equity, mm -hmm. those are the types of things we're talking about. How do you achieve that? Um, it's, a, it's a difficult dance. But and whether things... community character can think about that question is kind of where I'm going with it. So there are things that you can do that are different and outside of uh, the community character question. Um, there are things that you can't do. Um, the example I would give you is if you require a certain amount of the housing to be affordable in a, in a, uh, in a development. Mm -hmm. Can you say that that housing has to be made available to town residents or to specific town residents, veterans, fire company, people, etc.? That is yes. I don't think mm -hmm. that what we've been working on points that way. And, and the reason I don't know the answer to that it is points yes to, is because, you know, affordability as based right. on income. The reason, I the reason I say I don't know whether the answer to that is yes, and I'm assuming there's no federal dollars here because clear if there's federal dollars here, there's a different discussion. Um, the reason that is, is that the fair, the fair housing law applies and the intent to discriminate is, is important. So depending upon that interpretation, and I don't know the answer myself, 
I would tread very, very, very carefully if you're starting to think about preferences in terms of affordability and, and how you and how you improve things. No, they were clearly if, talking about yeah, okay. And clearly, if you uh, clearly if you have a federal housing project, a low income housing tax credit, a rough code project, a low housing tax credit, I think there's another one in town, which is a USDA project. Those have specific rules with respect to preferences, and generally, they're difficult to apply a, a geographic preference uh, without uh, a study and an indication of need, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing that I would tell you is. This is, a, I, this is my conversation with some of the economic development folks in some of the other towns, is there's an enormous need for, for senior housing, given what we're seeing from the demographics. But if the only thing we build is senior housing, we have an economy that depends on workers. So where do those folks live? So it's that balance. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was trying to ask. One of the things that the county just did, we, we identified a site on Golden Hill that uh, had a former jail. And there's some, there's some really great, um, not irony, but really great synergy with respect to turning a former jail site into an affordable house. This is my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, 164 units of affordable housing. We're going through the approval processes right now. The city has given us approvals. We're working on other things that we need from the city. Zoning has been changed. Um, Applications are in, but when we wrote the RFP to decide what we were going to build and who was going to build it, what we said is, is we want an intergenerational housing, housing project that mixes all of the needs associated with support housing, senior housing, and workforce housing. So the project that has now designed has 80 units of senior housing. Of those units, some of them will be devoted to frail seniors and supportive housing. It has 84 units of workforce housing, which will range from 30% AMI to 80% AMI. Overall, the 164 units will come in at around 55 to 60% AMI in terms, of, in terms of how they rent out. It also has a daycare center, uh, and it has um, and it has a community facility, community facilities, and it has about, I'd like to say about two or two and a half acres of green space and parkland. Now everybody knows AMI is adjusted median income. Yeah. Okay. What does it mean? Air Air adjusted. Air. Adjusted media, median income. Yeah. It's how you define housing burdenness. Yeah. It basically, it basically takes a look at the median income in an area and basically says if you have this, if this median income, this is what. These are the, the levels that people can afford. And generally, if you're looking at low-income housing tax credits, those levels have to be low, below 80%. Uh, and generally, if you want to get funded, they have to be below 60%. That's general. But I mean, that's the example I would give you of trying to basically find that balance between senior the needs for senior housing and the need for workforce housing. And what was meant by support? The third group? Support of housing, frail seniors, for example, would be one. Uh, there are other supportive housing programs that are out there, um, disabled individuals, uh, veterans. There's other supportive housing programs out there that work as well. I and, just, I want to hit on, Dennis, I hate to interrupt you, but the zoning proposal amendments that Judy's been working on and Deb's been working on will not change the use table. Yes, they're writing the code much better. And, and doing some clearing up of stuff, but it's not going to change the use code that's in place. Um, just so you guys know, and there's a law about if, if applications come into the planning board and the law was in place at a certain time and the law changes, it, it gets hairy on what you can apply and when. That's just, actually in the constitution, ex post facto, I think. So I, ju I just thought it was really important to point that out in that conversation, the question just, sorry, and let's continue. No, that's <laughs> fine. Um, is, does it, I, I'm talking Excuse me for a minute. Other people have questions besides in the room, If whenever you have a chance. Fine, I'm good. If, go the, if people use the hand raise thing, I have so been, they, I've they, had they it up for about five straight do. minutes and more. All of us have done the hand, been there, done that. Sorry, I'm not paying attention to the screen. I'm not even looking at it. Marina, <laughs> okay. shoot, go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to move back to, we're looking at, since we still have this slide up, the Kingston form based code, which is based on the transect that Dennis was talking about. 
Um, I'm on the housing committee with Deborah Dewan and others, and um, I did an extensive reading with, and I put up in the notes, a whole bunch of resources, definition for the transect, um, but it also has to do with the missing middle, which is exactly what they're looking at as well, that all this research for the missing middle, I put up information there too. The research for the transects, which has to do with the Center for New Urbanism, and smart growth movements together that created that. It's a different philosophical or ideological or paradigm way of writing zoning versus zoning that most of the nation has is based on quote unquote interpretation. What's really nice or advantageous, and I think that's what Dennis was pointing out, is that with the transect, with new urbanism, this type of zoning, it's very detailed oriented so that everybody understands what the goals are, what the rules, the standards, or the guidelines are. So we've been working on that the whole time. Huh? I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the screen and you were waiting. And I can actually see those, but I can't see people who don't do that because it pushes the picture of that person up to the top when they use that hand raise thing. Now, David Eckroff, I think it is, put in a comment about the design guidelines, the county design guidelines. Yep. I know that Nick go to the next slide? That. Yes. I think it's the next slide. Um, and there it is. There's the Ulster County Planning Board's design guidelines. I think they were done in 2017 or 18. Um, they um, are online as well as in PDF form. Um, you can certainly just use Google Ultra County Planning Board design guidelines to come up. Uh, that design guideline was developed using we use a consultant from the Regional Plan Association. Um, and it is really detailed in terms of the various things that you can that you can look at in here. And they they we define edges, centers, corridors. Uh, there's there's places we define places within the design guidelines, and for each place that's defined in the design guidelines, you can go into that place and look at the the form that's there. You can look at best practices that are there, et cetera. And then from there, you can also go in and look at best practices with respect to landscaping, with respect to uh, parking lots, and finally, which wasn't in the RPA uh, design guidelines when we when we worked with them, we worked with them on a rural design guidelines. We actually defined a rural place. And to reflect some of the concerns uh, that you know, some of the, the people that helped us uh, with this review process um, reflect some of their concerns. So there is a rural design guideline. We sometimes cite them. We don't cite them enough, in my opinion. I've had this conversation with staff and board, uh, but we but these things are real. They're a really good um, uh, resource uh, for design guidelines in terms of things that you, you want to look at. And they're they're. They're significantly more detailed than anything I've seen about. out there uh, that's generalist in terms of the count. When we were working with Nam on what kinds of things ought to be true for a, let's say, a triplex, and we've ended up with, it needs to resemble a private house, which is a very general kind of thing. And it needs to have some facade interest, but there was a tendency to go to, it has to have at least one of the following, you know, a turret, a bay window, uh, a porch, you know, very specific kinds of things. And I lived in Michigan for a long time, and there's a town called Frankenmuth, <laughs> where the town guidelines require everything to look like Bavaria. And it's kind of a joke. So I was very sensitive to over controlling the aesthetics. And we haven't, I think. But we were pointing to this document as a, as a useful thing mm -hmm. for us to incorporate. Yeah. Anything else? Dennis, I think one of the things that the town, that the planning board struggles with now is areas. You know, we have the village commercial, we have the Hamlet commercial, we have neighborhood commercial sectors. And uh, those are areas that commercial activities are permitted. And as they come into us and as they uh, get moving forward, we seem to have a, a contest back and forth between the, the, the residents that live there saying that um, this commercialism is, is, is not, uh, um, not uh, character of the neighborhood. 
because there's but commercial prop buildings are permitted. And I think you pointed out before, as long as the planning board reviews a commercial operation and it meets all the all the uh, zoning, all the requirements, then uh, it, it is in the community character. Is that I see it? There's always a there's always a tendency to sort of shorten um, the, the concerns that in terms of this discussion that, that need to be undertaken. And the last thing I want to suggest is that um, somehow if you meet the minimum requirements of the zoning statute, you're allowed to move forward. I mean, planning board is there to essentially have discussions about it. It is a, it is a decision-making process that's either between the planning board and the, and the applicant. Um, and those kinds of discretionary discussions, I think, make for a significantly better place. I, I would, I would look askance at uh, someone that comes in and say, "I meet all the requirements of the zoning zone code, therefore give me my permit." Mm -hmm. Because if that's the case, then you're, you're not needed. I love the word mitigation. <laughs> like that's, I feel like you come here in the beginning and we mitigate until everyone is happy. Yeah. <laughs> What I would say is, is that um, the, the, the neighborhood and the people that are having this discussion are protecting their investment, their families, uh, their children. Um, and the last time I was at a, uh, I was at a ribbon cutting for an affordable housing project. And one of the things that I always enjoy is they usually have one of the people that have moved into the project speak. And this gentleman got up and spoke and he, he spoke about how much it meant to him to have a home. And he addressed the fact that it was really difficult to get that approval. They went through a lot of neighborhood opposition. And so you never, you didn't know where he was going. He was like, you know, well, I don't know. And then he, and then he said, I respect them because just as much as I wanted a home, they have a right to have a conversation with us about protecting their home and protecting their family. And so what we need to do better is have them understand that I'm not a threat to their home, that the project is not a threat to their home. And I think that's that's the approach here. The approach is, is it turns it turns somewhat um, to an us and them discussion or or this or that discussion, rather than rather than a discussion that basically says we hear the concerns. These these are ones we can put on the table and work on. These are ones we're going to take off the table and think that think that they're out of line. Um, and you do that with some um, some care and some concern. That you're listening, um, and I think if you do that, people people in the opposition or people that are have concerns about a project feel that they've been heard, and they feel that what you've done is essentially all you could do under given the circumstances that were there, and you can mitigate their you can mitigate their concerns. I, I wouldn't say that there are some people that are continuing going to say I don't care what you do, they just want the project to go away. But look. If you've got a neighborhood that's always been residential, even though it was zoned, it was zoned heavily commercial, and there are lots of mixed-use buildings, and you take a property that has been rental properties for 50, 60 years, and that is being converted into short-term commercial use, that's a real major change in the neighborhood. It's permitted by the zoning, but the objection of people who live across the street from that is a very reasonable one. And that's, what do we do with that? So your, your hands are somewhat tied because if you tell me it's permitted, then it's, it, it's permitted, but I don't think that they're completely tied. So you sort of try to figure out what the concerns are um, and dress them to the best that you can. And it may end up being, some things may end up being that you can do on site uh, relative to noise, the example I would give you uh, some of the event venues that we've seen spring up in various communities, including here, 
uh, is that they require all music and everything else to be conducted indoors. Simply said, we're not going to allow you outdoors or in tents. You're going to build a structure and you're going to put it indoors. Uh, those are one of the things that you can do. The other thing that you can do, the example I would give you with respect to traffic, um, you can start to think about we're really concerned about traffic. And while the road can handle the traffic, we're really concerned about trucks, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to limit truck movements uh, in terms of time. Uh, or we're going to require um, some mitigation as it relates to crosswalks or as it relates to raised crosswalks or speed humps or something of that nature to make sure that the neighborhood is safe. Um, Turnarounds for emergency vehicles. Sorry, I'm just going off. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, <laughs> there are things that you can do that go beyond what you have to do in terms of making sure that the project is safe to, to, to address neighbors' concern. Um, one of the things I, I really, I go back, this one neighbor showed up at a meeting and I was just sitting there waiting to speak on a different topic. And he or she, I can't remember now, said, the real problem I'm having is, is if this driveway comes up right across from my house and that's my picture window and I'm gonna get the, the, the lights from those people moving in and out there at night are gonna come right in my house. And we're told we'll move the driveway 50 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, not, a, not a major change. I mean, you had to come in and circle it around a little bit, but, but it was a, you know, it was a good response from the front of the board. Uh, Burning is a really good response. You know, I got this park, I don't wanna look at a parking lot across my street. Okay, you're going to six foot burn the fence with a four foot fence on top, on top of it. And you don't see the parking lot. Um, there are things, um, lighting. The, the amount of things that you can require and deal with with respect to lighting now is just amazing. So, I mean, LED fixtures turn on and off in a, in a, in a heartbeat. They just bang. They don't have, they don't have what they call a strike, a strike time. So, you know, okay, after nine o'clock at night or whenever you close your lights, your lights go off and you're allowed security lights. And those security lights are the furthest away from the, the, the neighborhood, which is designed to provide security around your building. You're, so there's those kinds of things that you can think about that, that deal with that and that would come into a neighborhood character discussion. I think that is um, that is really, uh, really an appropriate thing to do rather than simply say that, by the way, you meet the requirements of the statute. Um, I'll give you another example, however, that um, how many times have you seen um, you reviewed the subdivision probably in the 70s, or, and now it has a cul de sac, and the cul de sac was designed so it could go to the next lot. That sort of design. And eventually we have a through road. Right? So, developer comes in and he says, Well, I want to go, I'm going to use this road, I'm going to go to the next lot. And the neighborhood goes crazy. The traffic is, you know, if you had a cul de sac at the end of your street, you may, you may want to think about sometime that road's going to go through, there's going to be a through road. And we've seen literally planning boards and various communities turn themselves inside out to try to make sure that if there was a cul-de-sac that was never used for its intended purposes, <laughs> you know, it was, well, let's, let's make them go out over here. Let's make them go out over there. And for me, one of the things, and, and or if they do use it, it, it's, it becomes a emergency access only and, and only the fire company has a key, right? And for me, I understand where the neighborhood comes from, but I also understand that there's a broader community concern here. Um, because if everybody's got to go back to the main street to travel for, through the neighborhood, then we get a lot of traffic on the main street that we don't have to have. Um, so the thought being is, is that we would we would amend the zoning statutes and say for subdivisions, if there's a cul-de-sac and an opportunity to connect to the adjoining, the adjoining lot, then we're must do that. Hmm. Because then you don't have to take the flag. And, and the applicant doesn't have to take the flag. Then what ends up happening is this requirement in the statute. And here's the reason why. So there's those kinds of things that can be done. But I would, I would, my I I absolutely positively understand and, and certainly would um, would take into account community, community concerns in terms of approvals. I don't think you can just say, and I think most applicants are now sophisticated enough that they understand that. Um, and the other thing is, is that just because the numbers work don't, don't, doesn't mean the project works. Uh, we've seen a lot of projects come in that um, the unit counts in, they can get, you know, they can get the setbacks done. 
Um, but at the end of the day, you look at the lot and you look at the land and you say, I'm working for us. There's something that we need to think about changing. Um, in the reverse of that, we had a situation in one of the communities we looked at and it was a fairly large lot. It had water, it had sewer, and a gentleman had proposed the use and he put the use in the center of the lot. I said, why don't you move this this way? Think about a building pot over here and a building pot over there and a shared parking lot in the middle. And they were like, well, that's not what I'm doing. And, and, and I went to the planning board and I said, you have an opportunity where you have a significant amount of public investment. You have sidewalks, you have water, you have sewer, you have street lighting district, et cetera, et cetera. Why don't you make him do that? Maybe he doesn't want to do it now, but there's no reason he can't put the lot. What he's trying to propose will fit over here. It fits fine. And it goes back to what I said when we started. It's very difficult for planning boards to start to think about moving things on the, on the site if they meet the zoning statute. A very reluctant planning board will say, I, I think we have a better mousetrap. Yeah. But it's something, if you're going to have a conversation about, to the BK, having a conversation about community character, you should have a conversation about how site development works, even if it meets the requirements of the statute. I think I've said enough. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? We've got a few more slides, Steve. <laughs> no, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> <He's hungry. laughs> Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. This is a horror show. Yes. <laughs> but, but if you look at that slide, that slide, and I'll be just angry. Mm -hmm. That slide basically says the community character discussion. That slide if on the bottom is. They just said it. They said that this 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 community wanted something had stone, heavy beam, et cetera, et cetera. Those were their sort of broad design guidelines. So when you look at IHOP, you don't see IHOP, IHOP with that kind of heavy beams and stone. It's actually a California site, uh, but that's that gives you a sense of the response, even though it's what I would call franchise architecture. It gives you a sense of what what the response can be to a, to a, even a, a, a broadly written community guideline. Wait. <laughs> Put that right on me. <laughs> <laughs> with, with a drive through, that would be, that would be <laughs> Yeah, we don't allow drive throughs. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great Thank day. You Thank you. Enjoy everybody. Enjoy the rest of their other holiday. Yeah. Yesterday was Passover, right? No, next week. Next week. Next week. Starts on, on Wednesday night, I think. Okay. We got to get you out of your now. office, Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. There's Dr. Bogey. Hey, Ford, we got, we still got some cleanup. Go close. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Bogey. Okay, on the unfinished business, we have to move to resolution. And, uh, Forget your money. Do we like me on that one? This is for the SDR transfer. Yes. Yeah. There's no big deal. It's just uh, we got to approve the resolution. Nice. Uh, and I motion that we approve it. Make a motion. Perfect. I love it. I'll Peter second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Okay. I use paper. I, 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 but I'm not making my own for that. It's just a transfer. Oh, yeah. Singleness permit. It's a short term. Short term. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. But the. SUP goes with the land, yes. so the new owner got the SUP. Yeah. So that's that. Uh, so uh, we have to discuss or make a motion to approve the memo and attachments to the town board and Supervisor McKenna. That's for the scenic overlay uh, listing that we want to send to the real estate people. So uh, is everybody read it? Yes. Yeah. The way it is. It was good. And we all kind of agreed online. So yeah, as long as you guys are all on board, I'll I'll shoot that over tomorrow. Okay, we're good with that. We got um, a couple of thank yous. Good. The other thing is I noticed the other day I was driving up Near Hill Road and there's a traffic counter, you know, the, the yeah. road counters on Near Hill Road. And I said, Well, that's a town road. And I usually have some by county, so I asked Melissa. If the planning board could get that data, because that would help us in, in any big developments or anything like that. Well, I met Bill the other day, and he said, absolutely, get any data that they do those counts on. And he actually showed me that it tells you the time of day, the amount of traffic. 
some really good information that we could use. Uh, so we learn we have a resource and mm -hmm. we can ask Bill to put into place traffic counters when we have like larger subdivisions or larger site plans, which Peter and I both were like super excited over. <laughs> yeah, it's big. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, we did have the uh, scenic overlay code. Uh, we had a couple of corrections. I don't see it down here, but it was so minor. Uh, well, I had picked up a comma, and you had said something I, about some glazing. I, I wrote them down. I can tell you guys the three right. that I'm going to do. You said that, that uh, the shiny, shiny uh, walls and shiny roofs uh, should be or shouldn't. So our three edits are a comma that needs to go in between, what was it? In between Foy foliage, foliage and drainage, drainage waves. Because there is drainage right. waves. They're two separate things. Um, Prohibition of highly reflective materials instead of what was the other word? Advanced. Should be avoided. 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 So yeah. we would like prohibition. Prohibited. Yeah, prohibited okay. prohibition. And the third one is more than 25%. This is less. Yeah, the way it reads, it says, and the glazing, it says if there's less than 25% of glazing, oh, I missed that. that. It means I it should say if there's on. more. I know. <laughs> I know that they caught our problem with elevation. So. <laughs> It's any wall. Yes. <laughs> not the end of elevation because the elevation it's shows walls wall. that are set back from each other as if they were flush. But yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that together tonight and these those are the three edits, but well, I'm gonna that, thank it's them. It's because exactly what we I sent a private note to Bill and I copied Melissa yeah. and I said, you guys got it. This is just what we want. Judy and I had a conversation, and I have to tell you all the trainings that you and I did and we all did and all our lists that we made and came up with everything. I felt like it was my checklist was literally like, check, check, yeah. check, check. Like it, we were so happy. Judy and I had a conversation, like I felt hurt. We all felt hurt. I felt yeah, hurt. It's, yeah. a, it's a yeah. huge improvement. And it is written so you can read it. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's clear, it's logical. There's no contradiction. I don't know who wrote it, whether it was you know Ed Sanders or Laura Ritchie or <laughs> Connor or who, but somebody who knew how to use the language so that people would understand it and be able to act on it. It's great. Awesome. So uh, uh, Bill McKenna, the supervisor, wrote us a letter saying that uh, the town board has agreed to accept and review the planning board's changes in the scenic overlay. So now we're going to send it to them. If everybody's good. This is so, these are so small and they will see the logic of it immediately. Yes. Yeah. It's like, finally. Yeah, it's very, very well done. Should have had a bottle of champagne. So uh, I guess we all unanimously agree to send it on yes. to the town board. Okay. Oh, all right. Anything else? Now we, now we need something about clear cutting that isn't in the overlay. So, <laughs> I know, right? What, what, there was an Hudson Valley one today about the tree, uh, strengthening the tree protections here. Did anyone read that? I looked at the paper, but I missed that. I uh, missed that. But there was one other thing, one other note was that we, in, the, in the document, you used the word arborist. Oh, and forest. I have that too. Yes. And or forest. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yep, I have, I have that too. So there's yeah. four. Yes. There's four. Thank you for bringing that up. That someone walked in my office with a phone rang and I forgot that. Yes. yes. And on a separate yeah. note, by the but way, um, regarding wetlands, because uh, Deborah, Delon, and I spoke about a lot about improving the wetlands. So one of the things that we've come up with is to We've identified two wetland delineators. I'm one, but I can't do it for the town. So <laughs> we found two others. One that did the fan acres wetlands, and, and, and Deborah has another one. So that when we identify a lot that looks like it has wetlands on it, and we want to know if it really does. In other words, if, if, if the applicant gets their delineator and everything else, and we have questions, we can ask the applicant to um, to put up escrow for one of these two guys to go out and just oh, say yeah, you know this is this is yeah. is, is so Paul we, Rubin one of them? Just like he was the guy who worked on um, Terramore. I, I was pretty. Do you, do you know if it's Paul Rubin? Yeah, I don't know the name. Hydro. Hydro yeah. or something like that. Well, well, I can get them. But just them. like we did with That's the Forester, it's the same idea that we could then have. I we, love that we are building like. Yeah, so the reason being is we're supposed to have a wetlands inspector mm -hmm. <laughs> on the town. 
Uh, you know, well, we, we didn't still get a shared service agreement. So, I mean, that was part of our suggestion. But it's, it's, it's what Bill wants, is that instead of the town having to afford to have a wellness inspector on board, That's the right. applicant will have to pay for it. Yeah. Proponent to ask for it. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes sense. If they're the one doing development, why should the local taxpayers have As to long as we have people we trust yeah. to do a good job of it. Yeah. And, you know, we always say what I see on my map is an indication that there's something that needs to be looked at on Absolutely. Right. We know the property lines are not good. Right. And we have some reason to think that not all the wetlands information is perfect either. Right. So this way we'll have a, we'll get the names and then we'll vote to um, have them on board just like a, uh, just like a planner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we've been we've been pretty good with more than one people, and I haven't had any issue with yeah, escrow. Nobody's really pushed back on the escrow, have they? No, mm -hmm. no, so I haven't had anyone. Bad. I mean, I I sugarcoated. So we are, we are going to get for the first time for the first time I've been here over twenty years. We're going to get a month off. You were yes. Month off. John said to me, "I don't know if this happened." Before. I've never done that before. I mean, it kind of happened as a fluke because all the therapists at that training were well playing. <laughs> um, but and it's got, nice. And we've got two holidays that have been Thursdays. And, and, yes. And um, I plan on catching up a little bit and just breathing a little bit. But we'll be back at full force May, May 4th. We'll be back. Um, and I already have public hearing scheduled for the 18th. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So I just wanted to. Uh, you or anybody else wants to look at that. This is what we do in surveying to put property lines Sorry. on an ortho exactly. I mean, to the hundred. I want those orthos. I mean, I don't the, know where those are. I get the ones from the state and they only do them every three to five years. You know, this is where that's uh, a higher resolution image than where really uh, Jerry Washington and we all went back and forth. This is state plane coordinates and it's the only way it works. I know Jerry kept saying, Well, any coordinate system will work. No. Only state plane work, and if you do it, you're exact. I mean, to well, the tip of a pen. What database is it? Hmm? It's it's called state plane coordinates. It's state well, it's a it, the the thing is there are a lot of different ways of measuring where something is on the globe. In other words, they they broke the state into sections because the state curves and has all different you know geological positions and. The, your coordinate system very slightly. So they made it exact in certain areas. So we're New York State East is, is our coordinate system. Very slightly because of the curvature. From most of the area. things that I do, it doesn't matter. But if I was using that level of precision, I could put the, right. the tax maps into that same coordinate right. system. Whether they would be accurate is still a question since they were built from paper documents. Take a look, you'll see how, how exact we can it's crazy. do property lines. That, I really would like to have the ability to do that. Right now, as you know, I mean, I don't get in that close. I don't see this level of detail from the stuff we get from the state. And it's every three to five years. So it gets obsolete pretty fast. So I need to talk to somebody in, in County planning office about where these are. Yeah, that'd be a way to approach it. But just, I just wanted to see how exact we can make it. I made a phone call to try to get um, access to the MLS when we post the realty because I have people call our office every day and ask me about the parcel and you know, and I'm I'm nice and I'm kind and I give you what information I have. So how are we doing for a, a new member? Any no any, word. No word. Any guy? Anybody know anybody? Yeah. We need he, another member. Sent over the three people I left, but I haven't heard anything from Bill. I took Brian's name off and put unfilled. So here at a, a certified wetlands delineator, can you tell us to what standard they'll help? What standard? Yes, what you know, how do we know you're gonna do a good job? What the standard for a certified it's it's uh it's you have to get certified by the Army Corps of Engineers. Because and you have to get trained. Yeah. Hey, you went to school. And there was a, there's a book, a big a code book by the Army Corps. To follow it's a big thick book. So you have to follow the delineation. And, and if you sign off on something, you're you're putting your reputation on the line. Oh yeah. <coughs> oh, just like an engineer or anybody else, sure. Oh, absolutely. Because what happens is Brian Rizell from the 
from the federal government will come up and he will check it for you. And I've had him move a, a flag for me two feet. I had a flag on a branch and he came along and said, no, I had to change all the maps. All the maps for the subdivision. You've got to be right or they'll get you. Peter, I want to ask you a question about this. The property lines are shown as being some feet off of the edge of the road. Is that right? Oh, yeah, sure. Because most roads are 50 foot wide. Oh, and, and then the, the easement for the road is the rest right. of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's why when we're surveying and we're digging holes on people's lawn and they come running out and say, You're on my property. But no, we're on city property. Mm -hmm. The sidewalk is on the city. Anyway, anybody else have any questions before your long vacation? Have some great dinners out on Thursday night. <laughs> All right, I'll take a adjourn. motion to adjourn. So moved. So All in favor? Aye. 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 Gray, I have a question for you. I started.